Hari, over to you. Oh, okay, uh, thank you very much, Tom. Uh, first of all, I'd, I'd like to thank Tom and David uh, for inviting me to give this talk on the Gomez de Costa family of London. Uh, I have to admit uh, to feeling a little bit intimidated uh, given the illustrious roster of speakers we've had so far that I've watched over the last few months. So uh, apologies if I don't live up to their standards, but I, I hope to give you a slice of the research I've been conducting, as Tom said, for about a year now. Uh, I should also say in the spirit of full disclosure or repeat what Tom said that the, the Gomez de Costa family aren't my family. Um, I'm an in-law. Uh, they're my wife's uh, ancestors. Uh, and my wife, Tess, is descended from Abraham and Abigail uh, Gomez de Costa, who arrived in London as Vindos, uh, or refugees from the Portuguese Inquisition, in 1727. Um, I began researching the family for Tess and our daughter's applications for Portuguese citizenship, and uh, became quite obsessed with it, as I've discovered uh, is quite common uh, among people who go through that process. And I've been digging deeper uh, ever since. Um, Tess is descended through Abraham and Abigail's eldest son, uh, Aaron, and his wife, Miriam Rieti, uh, and then their daughter, Grace, who became Grace Cohen. Um, in the, in the last year, I've, I've made contact with lots of Gomez de Costa descendants, but I've, I've yet to come across anyone else who's also descended from Aaron and Miriam. So if you're out there, please do get in touch. I, I'd love to hear from you. Um, that said, I have met and spoken to many people who are descended from uh, Abraham and Ab Abigail's other son, uh, Isaac, and his wife, Esther Diaz. Uh, and I know they're scattered all over the world, in England, Israel, the United States, Australia, and I hope some of them are watching today. And if you are, hello there. So um, hopefully you can all see my screen now, and I'm just going to start the presentation. Um, now, I've titled the presentation Chasing Shadows. Uh, bringing the Gomez Costa family to life. Uh, because most of what we know about Sephardic ancestors in London um, from this period are from records like the Circumcision Register or the Book of, sorry, I'm just going to yeah, get rid of that, Book of uh, Ketubot uh, of uh, Bevis Marx. And these are fantastic resources, but the, the people we find here are more like shadows. Uh, as uh, the great R.D. Barnett uh, termed them, sort of ghostly figures. And the resources that we have don't really answer questions like, what did they do? How did they live? What was it like for women in particular? Uh, so my talk today is going to be about the first two generations of the Gomez de Costa family. That's... Um, like, uh, that's uh, Abraham and Abigail, uh, then Aaron and Miriam, uh, and Isaac and Esther, uh, and a bit about two younger siblings, uh, Esther, who married Jacob Musafia, and Abraham. Uh, I'm also going to mention Aaron and Miriam's children, uh, Grace and her four brothers, and also mentioned that Isaac and Esther had nine children, two daughters and seven sons. But as I say, the third generation stories are going to have to wait for another talk. Uh, along the way, I'm also going to give you some idea of the sources and methodology I used, which may help others who are researching, um, researching their own families. So let's start with Abraham. What do we know about his backstory? Well, not very much at all. Uh, we know he was born in Portugal, but we don't know when. Uh, we also don't know the names of Abraham's parents or where the family were from in Portugal. Now, some family trees that you can find on the commercial genealogy sites like Ancestry and Genie come up with the names of Abraham's parents as Patrick Aaron and Anne. Uh, so... Patrick is uh, completely ludicrous because uh, 
it's not even a Portuguese name. And what I suspect is it's a corruption uh, along the line somewhere of patriarch. Uh, Aaron is a little more plausible in that Abraham's eldest son was named Aaron. So his father could also be Aaron based on Sephardic naming patterns. But in reality, there's no evidence for any of these names. So I think we need to discard them. I do have a theory about where the Aaron and Anne attribution comes from, but I'm going to deal with that uh, later in the talk. Uh, what was Abraham's occupation? Again, a question mark. Uh, family lore says he might have been a shipwright, possibly with connections to the Caribbean. But basically, we just don't know. What about Abigail? Uh, again, we know she was born in Portugal, but we don't know when. We also don't know her parents' names or the names of her, the name of her hometown. Uh, one source, the Vindos de Portugal table on the Nation Between Empires website, uh, names uh, Abigail's parents as Fonseca. The family name is Fonseca. Um, now, I'm not discarding that idea because... Uh, the uh, Nation Between Empires site is a very credible source, um, but I'm not sure where that comes from because it's not in the uh, Bevis Marx records. It's not in any other public records I've seen. That's the only source that I've ever seen that in. And uh, I've, I've emailed uh, Carl Vieira, who gave a talk a few weeks ago um, on the Vindos, um, but she hasn't been able to get back to me yet. But I'm just wondering if it maybe is a mistake, but for the time being, I'm, I'm just going to park that idea rather than discarding it. Um, but uh, we'll keep it at that. Now, uh, one of the biggest challenges to finding out more about the lives of ancestors in Portugal is that we usually have no idea what their um, Catholic given names were. Uh, if you know that, you can search through the Inquisition files to see if there are any names in any processos or autos de fe. Uh, in Abigail's case, I think I may have discovered what her Catholic name was and precisely how and when she came to England. Uh, we know that the Inquisition's activities went in waves, which then triggered flows of refugees and a particularly nasty wave began in about 1725 so that by 1727 uh, a trickle of refugees had turned into a veritable flood between 1727 and 1732 in the annual accounts of bevis marx we find the conta de fretes pago y gente vinda de portugal y españa so uh, please excuse my pronunciation. I'm sure that was all over the place. I've completely slaughtered it. But um, what that means is accounts paid to ship's captains for carrying people over from Portugal and Spain. And here we can see the page for the Hebrew year 5488, which corresponds to the third quarter of 1727 through the third quarter of 1728. And near the top, you can see the name of a Captain Diamond and the name of his ship, the Pearl. Uh, we can also see the names of the passengers. And here is something absolutely amazing and, and very rare. These are, these are Catholic names. So Rodrigo, uh, Francisca, Francisco, Damiana, Isabel, and so on. And there they are, hiding in plain sight. Francisca da Costa e Filho. Francisco da Costa and son, and below that, Francisco da Costa e mulher, Francisco da Costa and wife. I, I'm absolutely convinced that this Francisca is Abigail, and her son is Aaron. Uh, Francisco is Abraham's brother Isaac, and his wife, Ribka. Of course, when they made this voyage, they didn't have these Hebrew names yet because they hadn't gone through the various initiations, so circumcision for the men and tebila, uh, immersion in the ritual bath for the women. So how can we be sure that this identification is correct? Uh, well, we can't be certain, but I'm, I am pretty confident. And, and, and the reason is this, I, I've cross-referenced the names in the Windows payments list to family names in the circumcision and Ketubot registers. What you get is a cluster 
of circumcisions between April and November for the passengers of the Pearl, corresponding uh, to the men and the boys. So the earliest is Damiana Fernandez's son, who I identify as taking the name Isaac on the 4th of April. Uh, our Aaron is next on the 21st of May. His uncle Isaac on the 13th of August, and I'll explain the significance of that gap in the dates in a minute. Uh, and Abraham Fernandez Enriquez on the 1st of November. Uh, there's an even clearer cluster of names in the Kitabot register. We have Daniel and Abigail Fernandez on the 24th of March, Abraham and Sarah Fernandez Enriquez on the 5th of May, uh, and Abraham and Abigail and Isaac and Ribka both on the 26th of May. Now, remarriages uh, took place once the circumcision wound had healed, which was usually around nine to 12 months. So where was Abraham? He wasn't on the pearl because we know that his circumcision took place three months after Aaron's on the 13th of August, which is why his brother Isaac waited until then. My guess is that they traveled separately for security reasons in case one of them was caught. Most likely he traveled on a later ship and, and the same document shows there were plenty of them where the passengers aren't named. And you can see some of the names there, the Braganza, uh, La Verga, the, the Virgin, Tegos, and captain's names and, and a whole bunch of unnamed people. So here's how the system worked. The Mahamad had a promise, a standing promise to pay British sea captains to take refugees back with them. Uh, this was obviously very lucrative for the captains who got two pounds per person. So for the 24 passengers on the Pearl, Captain George Diamond got 48 pounds, which in terms of purchasing power would today be worth around 5,600 pounds or $8,000 if you prefer, not bad. Uh, we think most of these ships were what were called mail packets uh, operating between Falmouth in Cornwall and Lisbon. Mail packets were fast brigs, so brigantines that carried, well, the mail, uh, diplomatic and state papers, and on the way back, usually gold bullion. Uh, it wasn't just the threat and consequences of being accused of Judaizing that had a chilling effect. Uh, on new Christian families like the Gomez de Costa, there was also a, a pervasive low level atmosphere of distrust uh, and enmity that must have been made living uh, an ordinary life, a constant struggle, a hostile environment, if you like. Uh, so take the example of one Manuel Gomez de Costa. I hasten to say probably no relation but someone that I found while searching for inquisition records relating to the London family. Uh, in a file dating from 1727, Manuel is described as aged about 30, a single and a merchant living in the village of Santarem, about 50 miles up the river Tagus from Lisbon. He'd applied to join the Brotherhood of Ave Maria, a particularly pious religious order. Um, now, the Holy Office of the Inquisition was not simply a judicial authority. It also served as a kind of domestic intelligence agency that carried out background checks on people applying for sensitive positions like this one. Uh, in Manuel's case, the uh, Inquisition employed a spy, one Antonio Sequeira, to, uh, Sequeiro, sorry, to conduct secret inquiries in Santarém to determine if Manuel was... Uh, uh, a, a legitimate and pure old Christian without any trace of an infected nation. Uh, and infected nation is elsewhere defined as, uh, elsewhere defined as a Jew, new Christian, Moor, or mulatto. Now, it's clear that by the uh, mid 1720s, at least, uh, outward observance wasn't sufficient to be considered pure. 
so one had to be without any trace of an infected nation, as they called it. So it's almost like a, a, a racial ethnic purity they were looking for. In Manuel's case, the investigator concluded in June 1727 that he was pure on his father's side, but that some people had expressed doubts about whether his mother might have come from a, a new Christian background. One can imagine that if Manuel caught wind of these inquiries, he might have been alarmed into fleeing just in case the probe took a more sinister turn. Having decided to flee and made their preparations, the refugees would have joined the ship, uh, the Pearl, maybe after bribing the soldiers at the quayside on smaller rowboats like the ones you can see here leaving the quay. Uh, the grand building behind is the Royal Palace and the square next to it, lovely as it looks, uh, is a much more sinister place. That's where the autos de fe were staged and people accused of Judaizing were burned at the stake. Uh, one can imagine the judder of apprehension and, and later relief as the refugees looked back on the city and the square as the boat took them out to join the ship that would sail them away to safety in England. Uh, the journey from Lisbon to Falmouth took about eight days. Uh, from there, the refugees would have traveled by horse-drawn carts or carriages, the 300 or so miles or 500 kilometers on, on terrible roads uh, to London. And that journey could take up to a week. Uh, from the circumcision dates of people traveling on the Pearl, I calculate that the vessel probably arrived in England somewhere around the beginning of April, 1727, the first half of April. Uh, unfortunately, maritime records for this period haven't survived in England, but maybe more can be found out from the Portuguese archives one day. Uh, once in London, the refugees would have settled into lodgings in the jumble of streets around Bevis Marks, the Sephardic synagogue that had opened its doors in 1701. And here we have a map showing the layout of the streets uh, around Bevis Marks in 1720. And uh, again, 25 years later in 1745. Now the streets uh, around the synagogue uh, contained uh, buildings that were leased by the synagogue uh, to house the needier members of the congregation. And my guess is that uh, newly arrived refugees, unless they had family that were already in London, would also have been housed in these buildings, which were collectively known as La Fabrica, the factory. In exchange for Bevis Marx uh, paying their passage, the new arrivals were expected to join the congregation within two weeks of arrival. The men and boys by uh, undergoing the circumcision and women, Tedila. This is when they would have assumed their new Hebrew names. And Abraham was a favorite of the patriarch of the family and in, in the case of the Gomez de Costa as well. Uh, now, looking at Aaron's circumcision in May uh, 1727, we notice an anomaly. He's listed as Aaron de Abraham. But how is this possible if Abraham hadn't been circumcised yet and therefore in the eyes of Jewish law didn't really even exist? Um, I, I think it's possible that Abigail somehow uh, convinced the rabbinical authorities that Abraham was on the way and I mean, they made an exception, uh, but maybe I mean, an expert could uh, put me right on that. And here are some more mysteries. Uh, going by the Bevis Marx records, the Gomez de Ch Costa children appear to have arrived in England in dribs and drabs. Uh, the first to appear in the record is little Abraham in 1725, age six. How did he get there? Who was he living with for the two years before his parents arrived? Then there's Esther. We don't have a year of birth for her, but let's assume it was close to Abraham's. Did she and little Abraham come to London together in 1725? This kind of makes me think there might have been a bit of a, a kinder transport situation going on. And maybe uh, Marana family smuggled their younger children out of Portugal first. Which still begs the question, of course, of who was looking after them. Uh, intriguingly, there are several candidates. In the Bevis Marx accounts, we find 
a Sarah Gomez de Costa, who appears as a recipient of various forms of sadaka, starting in 1707, all the way through to 1728. Well, who's Sarah? I think she may be the widow of Isaac Gomez de Costa, not uh, Abraham's brother Isaac, but an earlier one who turns up in the records in 1700 and disappears in 1707, the same year that Sarah starts getting payments. So that makes me think she might have been his, um, his widow. And, and then there's Judith Gomez de Costa, who is listed as Judith to Isaac. So she looks to be the early Isaac's daughter. If and how Isaac, Sarah, and Judith are related to Abraham and Abigail at this stage, we really don't know. But uh, all I can say is that I'm working on it. Uh, going back to the children, next up is Aaron, who, as we saw, is the one who traveled with Abigail on the Pearl. He was circumcised on the 21st of May, 1727, age 12. And then comes Isaac. And here again, we have another mystery because Isaac was circumcised in June, 1732, uh, at the age of 15. It looks like he may have stayed on in Portugal for another five years after Abraham and Abigail left. Uh, but if so, who was looking after him from the age of 10 to 15 and why did he stay on? About Abraham and Abigail's early years in London, we know very little. We don't really know what, what Abraham did, but it does look as though his financial fortunes suffered a steep decline from the mid 1730s onwards. This is a chart I prepared based on the Bevis Marks accounts of Abraham's promessas or voluntary contributions, starting from the second half of 1727 when he first turned up to the end of 1739. They're listed in half yearly payments in the accounts and blue represents the first half and green the second half. Uh, the amounts are, are in shillings. And we can see that Abraham is doing reasonably well until about 1735, when his promises literally fall off a cliff and never really recover. In fact, uh, there's nothing after 1739. So whatever kind of business he was engaged in seems to have gone disastrously wrong. Let's uh, fast forward now and look at what happened to the second generation uh, uh, as adults. Uh, the children of Abraham and Abigail we know most about are Aaron, Aaron and Isaac. They were actually business partners in an occupation known as wax chandlers. Essentially, they made and sold candles. Um, in those days, candles were made either of beeswax which was expensive and only used by the wealthiest households uh, and institutions like churches and the synagogue, or tallow, uh, which was made of rendered animal fat and cheap, uh, so used by pretty much everyone else. Aaron and Isaac appear to have been engaged in the trade in both lines at various times of their career. From around 1740, we can find records for Aaron living in Hackney, uh, a village on the outskirts of the city of London, specifically in the parish of St. John in Hackney. This is a map of the area as it is today, and the big green area uh, is called London Fields. And here's the same area from a map dating from 1745. And you can see London Field in the same place there. Although it was fairly close to the city, um, Hackney was still very rural in those days and had become something of a, a bourgeois paradise, a, a home to the middle class elite, uh, which included directors of the East India Company and former mayors of London. Uh, but it was also home to wealthier Jews, uh, such as members of the Mendes da Costa, uh, Aguilar and Rebello families. Uh, in fact, by 1760, all the gentlemen of the Mahamad had houses in Hackney. Uh, I regret to tell you that Aaron Gomez de Costa was not one of these wealthier Jews. However, the, uh, this type of clientele meant that Hackney was an ideal location for selling wax candles. I found uh, parish land tax records for Aaron beginning in 1741, all the way through to 1791. These show him living on Mare Street, and in later years, two adjoining cottages on Mutton Lane are mentioned. 
the map from 1745 here shows Mayor Street here uh, and Mutton Lane there. Uh, but in later maps, uh, Mayor Street sort of moves up and Church, Church Street, as, Mayor, uh, as it is here, becomes Mutton, uh, it becomes uh, Mayor Street. And this intersection area here uh, becomes Mutton Lane. Uh, my guess is that Aaron was always in the same property and that it was near or at the junction of uh, Mayor Street and, and Mutton Lane as it, as it later became. Uh, my, I also guess that the whole family might have lived here, not just Aaron, but uh, also Abraham and Abigail until their deaths, and maybe also Aaron's sister Esther Musafi after the death of her husband. Um, perhaps even Isaac until his family got much bigger. And since we know they occupied two cottages, I suspect the family lived in one of them and that the other one, or at least part of it, uh, was the tallow chandlery. Tallow was cheap animal fat, usually the waste material from meat, uh, often sheep or bullock fat. And it was prepared by first chopping the fat up into small pieces and then boiling it up in a large copper pot and the resultant mush was then pressed to extract the juice or tallow. Um, to produce a pure light, the chandler must wrestle with dead animal carcasses and the associated smell and mess. For this reason, chandlery was perceived as a very low class trade. And it was a trade that attracted refugees in, in some numbers, including Sephardic refugees from, from Portugal but also uh, Huguenots, uh, uh, French Protestant refugees. The name Mutton Lane gives us a clue as to why Aaron might have chosen to settle in Hackney. Uh, Mayor Street and Mutton Lane were along the main route from the north for driving livestock to the meat market in the city of London, that's uh, Smithfield Market. Uh, London Field was grazing land where sheep and cattle coming from longer distances might graze overnight. And you can imagine that Aaron had plenty of opportunity to obtain a, a sickly animal from the herds, literally passing his doorstep every day. Uh, perhaps he brought over a, a kosher butcher from the synagogue to slaughter the animal before chopping it up for the tallow pot. So how well was the chandlery business doing? Initially, not too badly. There's some interesting clues about Aaron in the public records. In the minutes of the Petty Court of Sessions, we find Aaron's name mentioned in seven years from 1741 to 1744, and again from 1751 to 1753, being summoned among a large number of other residents of the parish um, to appear the, here this day to show cause why they have refused or neglected to pay the several sums of money set down against each of their names which they are rated towards the relief of the poor of the parish of St. John at Hackney in the county of Middlesex and were due at Lady Day last past. So uh, he was basically summoned for failing to pay the poor rate on time. Now, poor rate or poor relief was a local income tax collected from uh, persons who lived in rateable properties, which included uh, Aaron's cottages. Uh, the fact that Aaron was summoned uh, over seven years for non-payment tells us a, that he was sufficiently prosperous to be assessed for poor tax, but uh, B, he didn't really feel prosperous enough to pay for it willingly. Uh, and the records show that he did eventually pay in each year that he was summoned, but he obviously resented having to do so. Uh, he was much more willing to pay uh, promessas into the coffers of Bevis Marx, though, uh, for 26 years from 1757 through 1783, we find him in the promesses. Uh, and after a gap of 11 years, he resumes making smaller payments until his death in 1798. Uh, by this time, Aaron and Miriam had raised seven children, although only five survived past childhood. Uh, speaking of children, time to look into another little mystery. And here we have the register of christenings or baptisms for the year 1751 of the parish church of St. Botolph Bishopsgate. Zooming into May and the second of that month, we find some familiar names. 
Abraham Gomez da Costa, son of Aaron and Anne. Now, if you recall, when we were discussing Abraham's parentage at the beginning of the talk, we mentioned that some family trees on the commercial genealogy sites named his parents as Aaron and Anne. Well, this record could explain how someone somewhere along the line got the names Aaron and Anne as Abraham's parents and put two and two together to get 517. But this is not Abraham Sr. Uh, but if it's not Abraham Sr., who is it? Well, I think it's, it's most likely a baby born to his son, Aaron, the wax chandler, and a woman named Anne, a, a Christian who's not his wife, and the baby is being christened because it's not Jewish. Uh, in other words, it looks like Aaron had an illegitimate child uh, named Abraham after his grandfather in 1751. What happened to this Abraham, or indeed Anne, is yet another mystery. Six years later, we find Aaron marrying Miriam Rieti, and they proceed to have seven children over the next 19 years, the last one being my wife's ancestor, Grace, born in 1776. Of Grace and her brother's childhoods, nothing is known. I suspect they, they probably worked in the chandri as children, maybe dipping and tripping, trimming candles. Uh, Grace wouldn't have received much in the way of an education as girls' education was generally neglected in the 18th century and also in the 18th century Sephardic community, although her upbringing would have been slightly better than that of working class girls who, according to the Jewish women's archive, were left in an appalling state of ignorance and drudgery amounting almost to slavery. So on to Isaac, Aaron's brother and his partner in the Chandrari business. Now, the reason we know they were partners is because something bad happened, as is often the case. Here we have a newspaper notice from January 1761 certifying the bankruptcy of Aaron Gomez da Costa and Isaac Gomez da Costa of Hackney in the county of Middlesex, wax bleachers, brokers, dealers, chapmen, and co-partners. The bankruptcy actually uh, was first announced in November 1760, but this is the uh, certification that came in, in January 1761. And Chapman, by the way, is another name for peddler. I had to look that up originally. Three years earlier, Isaac had married Esther Diaz, the, the daughter of Jacob Diaz, a wealthy coal merchant, who was also the supplier of the Bevis Marx congregation. Uh, and uh, Isaac and Esther would have uh, nine children in a long marriage before Isaac's death in March 1796, age 79. Uh, Esther was 20 years Isaac's junior, but she outlived him for only three years before her death in April 1799, age 62. Uh, the financial difficulties aside, in fact, more likely because of them, Isaac and Esther's marriage can't have been smooth sailing. And we can find a clue to this in something we can all relate to, tensions with the in-laws. This is Jacob Diaz's will, and it is a fascinating document, uh, drawn up on the 23rd of September, 1765, a week before his death, he makes the following bequests. To my son, Isaac Diaz, one shilling. To my daughter, Sarah Diaz, wife of my brother, Abraham Diaz, one shilling. To my daughter, Esther, wife of Isaac Rodriguez da Costa, one shilling. To my daughter, Abigail, one shilling. To my daughter, Rebecca, wife of Abraham de Paz, one shilling. So Jacob was effectively cutting off five of his children, uh, three other children, Abraham, Benjamin, and Hannah. He left the very substantial sum of 150 pounds apiece, but only after the death of their mother and on condition that they didn't marry without her consent. Otherwise, they too would only get, you guessed it, one shilling. This implies that Jacob was not terribly happy about the marriages of Isaac, Sarah, who had married her own uncle, Esther and Abigail. And to add insult to injury, Esther's husband, R. Isaac, is misnamed Isaac Rodriguez da Costa instead of Gomez da Costa. 
Uh, personally, I think this was the notary's error rather than a personal slight or, or, or worse, something that Jacob Diaz knew, knew that we don't. Uh, Isaac's relationship with his father-in-law can't have been that bad at the start because on the 19th of October, 1757, Isaac was admitted as one of the Yehidim, the fee-paying members of the congregation. And this was almost certainly a gesture to the Diaz family's status in the synagogue, excuse me, ensuring that the new son-in-law was properly acknowledged. So you can imagine that Jacob must have looked on in dismay as Isaac and Aaron's chandlery business went bankrupt in 1760. And he was right to be apprehensive. Uh, potential unpaid debts meant any inheritance that he would leave Esther would automatically go to Isaac's creditors. But worse was to come for Isaac, unfortunately. 15 years down the line from the bankruptcy in June 1776, we find him entering the debtor's prison of the fleet. A notice in the London Gazette describes him as Isaac Gomez da Costa, formerly of Gravel Lane, Houndsditch, late of Shoemaker Row, Tallow Chandler. It looks as though Isaac has branched off from Aaron on his own as a tallow chandler, but then things have gone horribly wrong. In the Georgian era and beyond, uh, those who were unable to pay their debts uh, could be jailed at the petition of their creditors. When Isaac was admitted, the fleet prison had only been rebuilt two years earlier, but it was not a new and pleasant place. Uh, the prison reformer, John Howard, visited in 1778, a couple of years, after uh, Isaac was jailed and found conditions to be overcrowded and filthy. And two years after that, the prison was burned down in a riot. Uh, Isaac may well have been discharged by this point, although we can't be certain as the committal and discharge books for those years were also destroyed in the fire. Uh, conditions in the prison reflected the social hierarchies outside. Wealthier inmates could pay to live in the relative comfort of the uh, keeper's side. Some even played the system, moving into the prison with their entire families to escape their creditors until an insolvency act, which was effectively a, a amnesty, cleared their debts. This is a, a famous engraving by William Hogarth from his series, The Rake's Progress, where the anti-hero is imprisoned with his family in the fleet. For the majority of inmates, however, conditions were pretty squalid, with many having to beg for alms from a grate at street level. Uh, and which category Isaac was in, or whether the wealthy Diaz family stepped in at least to pay to have him and his family, including two children under 10 at this stage, housed in the keeper's wing is, again, uh, something we don't have any answers to. In 1779, tax records show Isaac living in Hennage Lane, which is why I think he may have been discharged before the riot in 1789. Uh, Hennage Lane was right next to Bevis Marks, but it was also known as Lousy Lane. So this wasn't a salubrious address, I'm afraid. Uh, Isaac and Esther remained in poverty for the rest of their lives. Let's go back now to Isaac and Aaron's sister, Esther, who, uh, as you recall, I mentioned, married Jacob Musafia. Most women, especially poor women, and that includes poor Jewish women, were more or less invisible uh, in the Georgian era. Uh, there's usually not much more about women like Esther than their vital records, the dates of birth, uh, marriage and death, if, if we're lucky unless something bad happened to them. And this unfortunately was the case with Esther too. In January, 1789, so when she was probably in her late 60s, the minutes of the Muhammad uh, re record a, uh, a payment to the account of James Stratton, Poramantensa de Esther Musafia, for the maintenance of Esther Musafia. Uh, James Stratton was the owner of two private insane asylums among dozens that had sprung up during the Georgian era. One of Stratton's madhouses, as they were called, was in Bethnal Green in London, and the other, 
off Mayor Street in Hackney, just around the corner, literally around the corner from Marin's home on Mutton Lane. This is a, a drawing of the Bethnal Green Madhouse, which was an old Elizabethan building dating from 1570. We don't know which, which of the madhouses Esther was in, but I suspect it was the one in Hackney, probably also built in the same era. But neither of them can have been, have been very pleasant. A contemporary account of conditions at the Hackney Madhouse comes from an inmate named William Belcher, who spent 17 years locked up there from 1778 to 1795. So he was actually a contemporary of Esther when she was there. After his release, he wrote a pamphlet uh, published in 1796 entitled Belcher's Address to Humanity, which included a sketch of a true smiling hyena by which he meant the proprietor, although it's not clear if he was describing James Stratton specifically or proprietors in general. Belcher says that he was bound and tortured in a straight waistcoat, that's a, a straight jacket, fettered with leg irons or chains, crammed with physic medicines with a bullock's horn and knocked down, so physically assaulted, spending many winter nights cold from want of bedclothes, sufficiency not being allowed me. He complained bitterly that a madhouse was a premature coffin of body and mind where rapacity and brutality prevailed. Conditions at the Bethel Green Madhouse were not much better. Contemporary accounts aren't available for that building, but by 1815, albeit under a new owner, not James Stratton, its reputation had become so scandalous that a parliamentary select committee had to be convened. It found that uh, beds were so crowded together that they almost touched. Sometimes two or three patients had to share a bed. Many slept naked in unheated rooms and most were chained to their beds or locked in wooden cages from 3 p.m. to 9 a.m. the next morning. The straw they slept on was soiled and infested with vermin and the low ceiling rooms they slept in were steeped in the stench of their excrement. What was the nature of Esther's illness? Was she suffering from some psychotic condition or was she clinically depressed after the death of her husband and her mother Abigail in 1784? Was it dementia or Alzheimer's disease? We don't really know. In August 1790, whatever it was, over 18 months after the first mention of her admittance in the, uh, in the minutes, we find an entry authorizing the continued payment for five shillings per week for Esther's stay at the madhouse, but it notes she was improved, but not completely cured. I wouldn't take the reference to being cured too literally because madhouse owners at the time were a little obsessed with pushing the idea that madness was, in, was curable, but whether this was for humanitarian reasons or for marketing purposes is, is, is open to debate. In any case, the uh, August 1790 reference is the last entry regarding Esther's stay at the madhouse. And as she lived another 12 years, we can only hope that her final years were spent in some greater dignity. The Gomez da Costa story has ended up in a pretty dark place. So let's bring a little light back into it. Uh, the book of accounts for Bevis Marks for the year 5559 in the Hebrew calendar, 1798 in the Gregorian, contains a page entitled Serra, Portuguese for wax. Under it, there are payments over the year totaling around 125 pounds. The recipient is Aaron Gomez de Costa, then 83 years of age and still selling candles. I think it's very fitting that Aaron's last customer was Bevis Marks, the congregation that had embraced him and his parents as destitute refugees from Portugal, where he was circumcised into a faith that was only a dim ancestral memory, but whose powerful pull brought the family to England and freedom, where he'd met and married his wife, Miriam, and taken part in all the rituals initiating seven children into the faith the congregation in whose cemetery he'd buried his father and mother and at least two of his children, and where he too would soon be buried when his brief flame was extinguished not long after the last Hanukkah candle 
1798. Right, that's me. Thank you, thank, thank you very much. That was out, outstanding. Do you, do you want to stop sharing your um, desktop? Yes, sure. Uh, let me just figure out how to do that. Oh, um, and then then um, then we have some questions. I will shut that down. Well, actually, what I'll do is I'll I'll minimize it or I'll put it here. Like, right, that, that's better. Okay. Um, uh, my, I, my, my first question to you is, you, you, you said that you think they will, came from Lisbon to, or, or from somewhere in Portugal to Falmouth. <laughs> um, why, why, why do you think that? I mean, I, 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 I don't know, but in the past, I, I was looking at, um, in the National Archives in London, in Kew in London, um, the uh, f numerous legal cases of one Isaac uh, Robeo de Mendonça, who was importing fruit, uh, citrus, citrus fruit from Portugal to, to England. Um, and I've just, I, you know, I assume that that came into London because, you know, presumably that was the, the, the major market. I'm, ju I'm just wondering if, if you're a ship's captain with money to, to pick up, what, why you would be dropping people off in, uh, in Falmouth? Um, you may well be right, but uh, we can see from that uh, list of payments and for other years as well, between 1727 and 1732, that there's uh, certain ships that make this run regularly uh, with certain captains. So one of them is George Diamond, who was the, the captain of the Pearl. I yeah. think he, he turns up a couple of times over those years. And then there's a, a captain, Benjamin Lyon, who uh, I think makes uh, runs five times over that period. And that kind of suggests to me that these were regular, um, yeah. regular journeys. And the regular journeys were, were basically the packet boats I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a very obvious sort of route. Um, I also remember that uh, Carla Vieira, when we were, when she was giving her talk, um, did say that uh, a lot of the, the refugees escaped on, 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 on packet boats, packet ships from, from Lisbon to Falmouth. And Falmouth was the, the main port because it, uh, it, it uh, was a deep water port yes. uh, and was the closest to the Atlantic. So, uh, and that's where the, the, the route to Lisbon and um, the Iberian Peninsula ran. But I mean, yeah, it's possible that there was others, but I, I, I think, and I've tried to find out, I, I, I went to the um, National Maritime Museum in Cornwall. I rang them up and yeah. spoke to uh, um, the, uh, the archivist there. Uh, and he uh, told me that unfortunately, you know, they, the records don't go back that far. Um, the National Archives, for example, have uh, customs records and uh, dockage records and so forth for other ports, but, you know, not for that period. Um, but, but maybe, maybe we can find out uh, more from, um, from, from Lisbon. Uh, you know, I, 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 that's something I, I was going to look into eventually. But uh, yeah, it's possible. That, that it was another route, but that it seemed probable to me that it was the packet route. Thank you. Um, and, and, and another question from me, and sorry, sorry if, if um, other people have questions, um, you can type them or um, also every, everybody on YouTube, just, just type the questions there and we can um, share them. Um, with the family in um, Portugal, I mean, I've, I've you know, spend my time going down black holes in in, in yeah. the Inquisition archive, and 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 um, I, I looked at Gomez de Costa before, and I was just wondering about this this family uh, Gomez Chacon from uh, Pinel, um, and there was also somebody called uh, Da Fonseca uh, Chacon, and Fonseca is a name you've mentioned before. Mm. Um, do you do you have any thoughts? Or I I, I mean, it's 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 kind of a, you know, you could spend the rest of your life going down these rabbit holes, I yeah. guess. Uh, I, I'm afraid not. Uh, 
I did come across, I think, both of those names when I was sort of skimming the uh, yeah. uh, the, the records. Uh, but uh, as you'll know much better than me, uh, they're, 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 they're a pretty daunting <laughs> sort of thing. And, uh, you know, reading 18th century uh, uh, Portuguese script <laughs> is a skill in itself. And you know, it's very difficult to work out uh, what's actually going on. But no, I, I have to say, I, I, I haven't made that connection yet. Um, and, but that's, that's something to look at because having found out that her name was Francisco, or I think her name was Francisca, and that her uh, brother-in-law was Francisco, um, you know, hopefully that will give some sort of clue. And even if we can't find them directly, in the uh, Inquisition records, there might be other people whose family trees have been built, you know, by the Inquisitors um, that mentioned them. So, uh, but you know, it might take it might take some time to 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 reach that information. Yeah. So, so somebody was also asking before you you gave the names uh, the the ages of um, some some of the women. How how were you able to? To work out their ages, um, I can't remember which which women in particular, but you know the younger generation, Grace, Grace for example, is in uh, is in the book of births, uh, which I can't remember when that starts, but she was born in seventeen seventy six. The earlier ones, Esther is a guess. Esther Masafia is a guess uh, at seventeen twenty. I you know just from the way the other children were born but uh, that, that that that's pretty much um, that, that's pretty much it uh, esther diaz um i'm not sure where her where her birth date came from but uh, uh i'd have to sort of double check that but um, i think that i think that's right uh, maybe, maybe it came from one of these uh, ancestry trees that uh, you know you copy over yeah um, we, we actually have a message from uh, Carla, Carla Vieira, who's uh, okay. with us on, on YouTube, um, who, who, who thanks you for a, for, a, for a fascinating talk. She also says she didn't receive your email, so if you can ah. email her again. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> That'll explain it. That would do it, yes. <laughs> yeah. Tom. Uh, maybe I can tell something about naming conventions. Um, the first one to leave Iberia uh, when he received a, a Jewish name was commonly called Abraham. Yeah. And his sons were Isaac, Jacob, uh, Israel. And uh, when they got sons, they named them all Abraham after the grandfather. Yeah. And that is how so few there are so few, so little variation in first names yeah. in uh, Sephardic genealogy. Yeah. And um, Adam Brown said in, uh, in chat that among Ashkenazic, it was uh, common to call a convert um, Ben Abraham, son of Abraham. Mm -hmm. But I I don't know about Ashkenazic name convention, but I, I assume he's right. Uh, uh, Chris, Chris, for... uh, Chris Musicant has... Uh, yeah. Uh, yes. Hi. Uh, first of all, thank you very much. It was really interesting. Um, I can trace my ancestry back to the Abraham that you're talking about. Um, from Abraham through to um, Isaac. Yeah. Um, and then to Moses. Yes. Um, uh, but the Esther that I've got in the tree, who was a sister of Isaac, um, was not the one that you said married, um, the Esther that I've got down, married someone called David Mendes de Costa. Right. Is, and, that, and her date of birth I've got down, oh no, married in 1730 which doesn't fit with what you said at all, which is very no. strange. Um, I, I got uh, Esther Musafia from, from the, uh, the book of Ketubot, um, because she's in there, and she's Esther de Abraham, Gomez de Costa. But that's interesting. I think there might be quite a few confusions, because there's so yeah. many duplicates of names. Yeah. Um, the same names keep cropping up. Yeah. Um, but interestingly enough, a very distant relative who's also 
a descendant, used to joke about the fact that when he walked into Lauderdale Road Synagogue, instead of saying Shabbat Shalom to different people, he should actually just say, good morning, cousin, good morning, cousin, good morning, cousin, <laughs> because if you go back far enough, there are so many of them. Um, yeah. and, and a huge number of people can trace their, a, a, a huge number of people who are still connected with the London yeah. S&P can trace their ancestry back to this Abraham. Yeah, well, certainly um, Moses, as you say, seems to be a, a common ancestor. And uh, the other son uh, that, uh, of Isaac's that, that, that a lot of people are descended from is Hananel, the, the, the last born son. Um, uh, so, and they had huge families. Uh, and, and they also had huge families. So, you know, I, I, I've met at least a dozen people or, and, and I've spoke, spoken to and, and spoke, speak to regularly about half a dozen of them um, uh, who were descended from Isaac and, and either Moses or, or Hannah now. Um, yes. Anyway, thank you very much. It's very no interesting. Oh, thank you. Can, can I ask you, you referred to Henage Lane as um, where, where my rabbi lives, as, as, as Lousy Lane. What's, <laughs> what's, the, uh, what's the origin of that? Where, where was I, it from? I, I just I found that on the internet. Um, it was, must, must have been about a history of, uh, uh, of the streets around there. Uh, and at that time, apparently, it was called Lousy Lane. <laughs> <laughs> It's very clean, clean now. <laughs> well, I'm sure, I'm sure it is. I mean, that whole area is very clean. It's just full of gleaming uh, city blocks and sk skyscrapers and wine bars, as far as I can see. But uh, I don't think it was in those days. Uh, pretty sort of grim area. Yeah. Like, like most of George and London, I think. Yeah. Question for me, how common is the name Gomez da Costa? Gomez, of course, on itself is very common, and the Costa itself is very common. Yeah. So the combination of the two might be a name that's, uh, that uh, started at some point in different places in Portugal independently from each other. Or I, I think so, do yeah. you have a feeling that they are all uh, related? I, th I think you're right. Um, Gomez... Uh, and the Costa, we know, means means uh, of the coast, uh, but that doesn't even necessarily have to be uh, have to be Portugal. It could be Spain. It could be a sort of throwback to 1492, um, when when lots of uh, Spanish Sephardic moved to uh, moved to Portugal. So uh, yes, I mean, it probably isn't it? It's the marriage of, of Gomez with a, a da Costa, and then. You know, you have the, this composite name, but when that happened, I, I'm not sure. But these whole the naming, the names, the Portuguese names seem to be uh, very, very confusing. Uh, the the person I gave an example of in the talk, Manuel Gomez de Costa, the one who wanted to join the Brotherhood of Ave Maria, the Inquisition um, files uh, have have his family tree, and his father's name is uh, I don't know uh, Luis. Uh, Lavrador, and his mother has a completely different name. So it's not even Gomez da Costa. So he was the first person to be, to have the name Gomez da Costa. And why, you know, mm. is anyone's guess. So that, that's all a bit of a mystery to me. And I think I, I'd need to defer to uh, Portuguese um, historians on that, on that score. He could have been named after an uncle. Mm. Possible, yeah. yeah. Uh, there's a question about the uh, two other children, uh, Jacob Gomez da Costa and Rachel uh, born Mendes da Costa. Uh, what do you know about them? I don't think they are Abraham and Abigail's children. There's, there's actually a, a separate Gomez da Costa family living in Amsterdam uh, mm -hmm. around the same sort of time. Um, in fact, they start much earlier. They, they, they start from the, uh, the late 1600s. Um, and I've looked into them and I've decided after much research that they're not related. Or if they are, it was way, way, way back. You know, they branched off mm -hmm. uh, at a much further point. Um, and, uh, you know, there's also a separate uh, 
couple that turn up. Um, uh, her name, I think, is Esther. I can't remember now. Um, and and Daniel uh, Albuquerque da Costa, who mm -hmm. arrives in Portugal from uh, from Lisbon, and she's from Bragança, and is her surname is is, is uh, Gomes da Costa, and she has a brother called Jacob. Uh, but I think they're all they're all Dutch, basically the Dutch families. They 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 don't have, seem to have much interaction. In fact, no interaction that I can see with with the London families. But there are a lot of trees. I, I've I've got some in my possession that various members of the London Gomez de Costa family have sent me that are very uh, contradictory. There's all sorts of names on them of uh, uh, people like, as you say, Jacob and Rachel. Uh, and others, but um, I've built up the tree purely on, on anything that I could verify. Mm -hmm. um, you know, not just because someone sent it to me, but if I could find it in in, in the Bevis Marx records and cross reference it, then 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 I then I accept that. But uh, mm -hmm. so for the time being, I think I, I'm going to sort of stick with with what I've got. It's it, it these are the sort of verified um, verified names. Well, as, as time moves on, more will come online from yeah. the Bevis Marx uh, uh, archives. Yeah. And the most important registers, uh, the minute books of the Maramat are already oh. online. Yes. So um, those could be helpful. And there are all sorts of other registers which uh, might be helpful. Yes, <clears throat> yes absolutely. I, I thought, though, your um, looking at the promesses was was very interesting. I'm afraid my 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 family's just poor, so I never really uh, never really pay attention to those. Yeah, uh, I mean, you can learn a lot. But from they that could kind be of there. Mm -hmm. They could still be there because even uh, uh, poor people uh, uh, try to express their adherence to the synagogue by paying small amounts of. Uh, Tell me about it today. A few shillings, a few pennies. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. They would be mentioned. Yeah. They would not be able to pay Finta, uh, the, the synagogue tax. But yeah. uh, if they could miss a few pennies, then they would do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, maybe also with a mind, if I pay now, maybe I receive uh, poor relief later. <laughs> yeah, there's always that. Yeah. That's cynical. <laughs> uh, it amazes me how many descendants of, of Gomez de Costa are present uh, among our patrons. Uh, Word has gone out. Of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we are all one big family here. Yeah. Brilliant. Tom, Tom shall we? Um... Should we wrap up? Yes. Unless there's more, more questions anybody has. Uh, and maybe on uh, on YouTube. No, I've 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 I've, okay. I've I've asked those. So we 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 certainly look forward to um, part part to two. The, um, to the sequel. Yeah. Not too distant future. Well, I look forward to that. Yeah. And as always, uh, we thank our patrons for supporting us and for making it possible uh, to reveal family secrets like the ones of the uh, Gomez da Costa family. It's been absolutely brilliant. Um, next week's speaker will be uh, Gerard Wiegers, with an unpronounceable name for non-Dutch uh, non uh, speakers. Uh, he will talk about the family Palash, uh, early 17th century, and their involvement in politics in the Netherlands. Uh, I hope you will all be there, and see you next week. And thanks once again for watching us and supporting us. And thank you, Ali, for a brilliant talk. Thank you.